Hello and welcome to Green Pleat Talks. My name is Kate Armitage and I'm your host for our discussion today. And I'm delighted to be joined by Johan Hanekom, Director of Electric Vehicle Strategy at the Phoenix Works. Good morning, Johan. Hi, Kate. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, today, Johan and I are discussing SMEs and the challenges they face in creating a zero emission fleet. Uh, Johan, uh, the Phoenix Work has been a provider of charging infrastructure for quite a few years now. Uh, and for those who may not be familiar, um, can you give a brief overview of the Phoenix Works, uh, your customers and the services that you offer? Thanks, Kate. So Phoenix Works has been around for the last 10 years. So if you look at the landscape going back a decade, it was uh, you know, quite an incumbent space lots of developments at an early stage and the market was you know very experimental at that stage over the 10 years you know thomas newby and matthew morgan the founders have successfully built out the business to its current capacity you know 50 staff uh, in-house and then we have a field of technicians that also go out to site to work with our customer base um, the phoenix West has gone through various acquisitions over the last four years um, we bought uh, the phoenix works from Mitsui, who was the previous parent company. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's our first foray into this space. We have a tremendous amount of expectation around the potential that the EV revolution has for not just the UK, but also Western Europe, uh, where we have our operations in Switzerland and Germany and the Netherlands. Um, but we first wanted to bring in subject matter experts. And for us, the Phoenix Works was and still is the benchmark installer of EVSE, photovoltaics and battery backup in the UK, hence the acquisition. Um, we are looking at expanding that value chain. So looking at other participants within the service sector that we need to onboard um, either through joint ventures or acquisitions to give our customers uh, a complete end-to-end -end solution. Right, uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Johan, when we, we are, we're talking about SMEs today, uh, and, and when you're in discussion with the SMEs, what, what are the main reservations that they have about switching to zero emission vehicles, uh, and, what, and how do you address this? So, it's, it, uh, most of our work is around education pieces, you know, so um, because of the nascent nature of this industry and the concerns around range anxiety and how fleet managers can plan journeys effectively and efficiently, you know, so when a, when a vehicle is not able to service a customer or customers for that day, it impacts the brand's integrity, the customers become agitated and the whole service proposition falls apart. So it's understanding, you know, the miles that they drive per day, it's understanding the maintenance requirements that EVs have compared to an ICE. Um, so most of our work initially is just understanding what the pain points are for the fleets. There's also the total cost of ownership that you need to factor in. So if you've been a fleet manager for, let's say, 15 years, you're a subject matter expert, you're introducing a completely new animal into the equation. You know, an EV is a very different set of requirements. Charging infrastructure, you know, you can't just go to a fuel station to put in diesel or petrol. You've now got to plan your journey to, you know, quote unquote, refuel with dry fuel. Hopefully in the future, there'll be a situation where you have you know, a plethora of charging stations at fuel cords so that dual fuel can be put in, um, charging hubs. But for the majority, fleets either reside at the home of the, of the driver or at a depot. So a lot of our discussions are around installing charging stations at the home where the drivers take the vehicle back. Um, how does that then work in terms of splitting the costs? So if your home bill is the bill from which you draw the power, how can you then tell your employer which part of it was for the company vehicle and which one was for your personal consumption? Um, educating the drivers around the requirements that that brings to the table as well. Physical constraints, because not all drivers have homes with driveways. So what do you do if your vehicle is parked on the road? So these are the discussions that we have initially. So it's much more of a strategic objective to be achieved. And then we get into the nitty gritty of these are the costs, these are the types of charges that we recommend the pros and cons of each brand out there. So um, most of my discussions are around educating the consumer around the constraints that are there in place at the moment, but also the reassurance that as technology develops, less and less of these constraints will be applicable. Um, and that range anxiety will then systematically go away. Um, 
But in terms of customers, you know, we, we are working with a fairly large number of fleet managers. Um, we're currently looking at electrifying a fleet of over 15,000 vehicles, which is a massive endeavor for us to coordinate the education piece for the drivers, um, the driver training to ensure that they, you know, drive the vehicles in the appropriate fashion to ensure that the battery has the maximum range considerations around, you know, wintertime operation versus summertime, you get more mileage in winter versus summer out of a battery. Um, and really getting the, the fleet managers comfortable with how it will affect their lives in the future. It's inevitable. And one has to, you know, in the absence of a propensity to just mass adopt, systematically integrate electric vehicles into your fleet. We spoke earlier about hybrid versions where, you know, plug in uh, hybrid electric vehicles, um, could be a, a you know an intermittent solution, but if the if the plan is to go full electric, you know for us it is a case of understanding that five to ten year roadmap and how we can start systematically integrating it into their fleet. Okay, and, and so Johan, there's a couple of things there um, that I want to just unpick. Uh, so you mentioned that you were um, uh, working with one of the very biggest fleets with hmm. fifteen thousand vehicles. Uh, and it's really important that these big fleets um, uh, prove that it can be done and can be done at scale. Uh, but actually, uh, doing something like this at scale does bring new problems, particularly around the availability of power uh, and constraints uh, in terms of the, the grid and the cost of upgrading. And I kind of think, um, there's an opportunity here for SMEs because they don't need to get caught up in some of that longer term planning and anticipating when the grid, up, grid upgrade is going to be. If it's a smaller fleet of, let's say, uh, 5, 10 or, or 15 vehicles, um, I think a lot, a lot of that complexity should melt away. Is that your experience? And, and are you seeing that SMEs are able to actually pivot much quicker? Yes, so to your point, you know, we, um, because of our existing relationship that we have with, with SMEs, um, it's a net benefit to have those discussions with them as well. Because yes, to your point, if you're looking to install, let's say 10 chargers at your depot for 10 of your vehicles, it's a much, much easier process to go through than say, you know, a thousand chargers, you know, spread across the country. Um, both in terms of a capex point, the planning cycle, the onboarding, the training, and even sourcing the vehicles. You know, something as basic as finding an electric van because of the chip shortage we face currently globally um, are pain points that um, you know have have impacted the fleet manager's ability to convert to an all electric fleet. Um, the opportunities that we see within the SME sector is actually the the early adopters can push the narrative very quickly in their local communities. So. We have quote unquote mom and pop shops or service providers who want to be seen as green by their customers. So whether you're a florist or a local delivery company, you know, or somehow tied in with last mile deliveries, there is an opportunity to promote your business as a green organization. I, I see in London several companies driving around where there's a big ad saying this is a zero emission vehicle, and then a smaller picture saying, you know, we're a florist. So, you know, it's part of that goodwill exercise for your community and the feel-good factor that it generates for your business and, and being good citizens of the grid. Um, albeit the conversations we have with large fleet managers and small fleet managers are consistent in terms of the queries that they have. So how does this financially impact me? Is it more expensive to drive an EV versus an ICE? Um, what are the restraints around um, having stranded assets? You know, if I'm going to spend 20 or 30,000 pounds installing charging station infrastructure, what guarantee do I have that in a year or two's time, it's not redundant? And then I've got to go through the same exercise again. So yes, the, the, the challenges and within those challenges, there are the opportunities to become a green fleet or an all electric fleet do differ when you speak to the larger players. Um, but I have to say the, the, the urgency that there is with the SMEs is, is very inspiring. You yeah. know, on, on a regular basis, we get inquiries coming in from even remote areas of the UK where people who perhaps have less of an inclination to do it have made a proactive decision 
to do it for the sake of their communities and also to to get to get on with having an electric fleet so that you get comfortable with how you run an electric fleet versus an internal combustion engine fleet yeah I, I, I totally agree i totally agree and of course if it's a local business like a local florist a lot of the challenges around range disappear um you would know very quickly as an sme whether or not payload was going to be a, a challenge mm -hmm. um you don't have to do exhaustive surveying of your thousands of employees to work out who would be prepared to switch and whether or not they've got off-road parking um so i just think it, i think in many ways that this this a real opportunity for these SMEs to just come under the radar and and do it. Um, I think I, I have heard um, from a from a vehicle supply point of view, and I think you touched on this. Um, you know, the focus at the moment does seem to be on those big orders, the fleets that are able to say, "Well, I'll take eight hundred or I'll take a thousand. Uh, and that vehicle availability is perhaps a bit harder for SMEs. Is that something that you've come across? Yes, yes. And that, you know, we, we are in discussions with the OEMs to help facilitate this process. You know, this is a joint effort. You know, you've got consumers who are willing to, quote unquote, take the leap of faith to buy their first electric van uh, because they believe in the narrative, which is, you know, it's important for the environment and fundamentally it's important for their back pocket, you know, from a profitability point of view, it is more profitable to drive an EV or to have an EV fleet than it is to have an internal combustion engine fleet, period. If you look at total cost of ownership, the economics makes complete sense. The challenge then lies in if, like my friend, a very close friend of mine has a, a carpentry business here in London, he's looking for two vans and he's unable to find any because fortunately we have very large companies looking to electrify their entire fleet as well and they're having to place these orders well ahead of time because there's a bidding in period for the manufacturers to actually produce the vehicles so the challenge is that we actually have more people wanting to get on board with an electric fleet but the challenge lies in supply now um, hopefully that challenge will be addressed because as more and more people get on board and start putting in their orders the OEMs will have that confidence to produce at scale. The risk is mitigated because the order book is full. Yeah, it, it definitely will ramp up. And this is a, it is a short term problem, there's no doubt. Uh, my next question was going to be around, you know, what more can be done to support uh, SMEs in this journey? And it sounds like helping to grease the wheels of that supply chain on the vehicle side uh, is an important area. Um, in terms of the recharging infrastructure, um, but we know no matter what size of the business, that reliability of that infrastructure is absolutely crucial. So if, it, if a vehicle fails to charge uh, overnight, then that, that can cause some serious operational mm. issues. Uh, from the, uh, the Phoenix Works point of view, um, what, what do you offer in terms of charge point servicing and maintenance and repair? Yeah, so we, um, as, as an, you know, the Phoenix Works started life as a, you know, a hardware agnostic uh, company. So we, our only caveat was that we wanted to work with partners that shared our mindset and vision and quality of standards. You know, in the, in the sector that we find ourselves, you start losing money when you go back to site to fix problems. So it's important that the hardware is best in class, whether that's photovoltaics or the charging station infrastructure, the software that we use, you know, the battery backups or the heat pumps. Um, you know, we, we do have preferred partners that we work with in the United Kingdom from a hardware point of view, the likes of you know, Indra and Atrel, these are recognized brands. Um, we've also worked with parties like EO, we installed Tesla, Wall, wall packs. Um, and we continue to build out our relationships um, with, with key manufacturers in this space. And, and, and the landscape is evolving. Every single day of the week, you hear about new charging station manufacturers. It's becoming an extension of any technology company's value proposition, you know, because fundamentally, it's a way to charge a battery. And there are lots of companies out there that charge batteries. Um, from our point of view, as you know, we see ourselves primarily as a consultancy. So you know, we want to better understand your challenges. 
we then want to find the solutions that are fit for purpose. And if we don't have those solutions in-house, we're more than happy to work with external parties, provided again that they meet our requirements in terms of standard and their ethos uh, within this uh, within this space. Um, and then also looking for joint venture opportunities with partners who have skill sets that we don't have. You know, we we are as we engage with larger and larger opportunities, it's because Coming very clear that we need a coalition of the great you know if we look at this let's move on from the phoenix works for a second and see it as there's an there's an, a, there's a reshuffling happening within the energy sector an inflection point where for the first time in our history you've got electricity generators speaking to automotive manufacturers who are speaking to installation companies and clients it, you know it's if you've got, last year i was with sema out in Las Vegas, and you had Sony produced a prototype vehicle, an electric vehicle, you know, a company that is associated with, you know, high fires and televisions, you know, said we might look into producing electric vehicles. You've got companies like Apple saying we want to have that ownership of the customer as well. So, you know, the world that we see right now, which is, you know, conventional speaking OEMs manufacture cars, you know, tech companies like Tesla, fundamentally a tech company that has the vehicle as an extension of its product offering. Liberty Global is a you know, telecoms company that is looking to also see its role in this ecosystem with electric vehicles and connected vehicles, um, homes that are smart in every sense of the word, where you know the lights in your home right now could be powered by your electric vehicle. It knows what the state of the battery's charge is. Tonight, when there's a, a, an event in the grid that requires some kind of frequency or demand response, we can reach out to you, Kate, and say, if you don't mind, we'd like to switch off the charging of your vehicle, and we're happy to remunerate you for that. This is the, the, the world that we see ourselves living in in the near future. And the exciting part that we have to play, every, every contributor in this space right now, be it a competitor or collaborator, is to help shape that narrative. And it all starts with consumers feeling comfortable and confident with the transition from an internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle to dissipate any consideration about range anxiety and to feel that whichever partner they choose is trusted, respected, and has their long-term best interests at heart. So it's very much a lifetime relationship. It's kind of like banking in the old days where you know, you would form a relationship with the bank manager and, and that person would be tied in with your financial well-being for the balance of your life. They'd help you with your mortgage. They'd help you with a student loan. They'd help your kids open a bank account. You know, as a telecoms provider, you know, we want to be part of your personal life. The handset that you have, the television that you watch, the data you consume, the charging of your electric vehicle. You know, for us, that is the, the long-term relationship that we wish to foster with you. And the Phoenix Works is the starting point of that conversation with you as an electric vehicle driver. Yeah, okay. And I think um, from, an, from an SME point of view, uh, that all sounds great. Uh, and uh, I'm, I have no doubt that, you know, they're looking for uh, suppliers and partners who can provide that long-term reassurance and support. You mentioned stranded assets, um, which of course is, is a, a big concern. Uh, but um, part of me, part of me thinks um, it needs it needs to be presented in such a way, certainly to small businesses, where um, they they are, can participate in these things. But the level of engagement that you you need from them needs to be quite low, quite modest. Mm. So fine, you can you can do a, a vehicle to grid. Uh, charging on my vehicle while it's in the depot overnight, but please don't make it a chore for me. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of where the whole market is really, because it's all still quite difficult. You know, it just needs to become much easier for businesses where this is really not their key priority at all. Correct. Yeah, and and that's you know the, every conversation that I have with SMEs or fleet managers, even third party consultants, revolves around the topic that. It's quite a disparate market still. You know, there isn't a single credible source of information to go to to say, you know, this is how we do it. Um, to that end, it, it's the duty of care for companies like ourselves and others in this space to potentially, you know, first remove the sales hat and, as we said in the beginning of this conversation, to to see it as an education piece 
talk to the customer about what your experiences are within their sector, similar challenges faced by their peers and how those have been overcome. Um, you know, over the last 10 years, the Phoenix Works has the benefit of you know, numerous customers in various verticals that we can point to. So whether it's HMRC that we've worked with or the post office or Uber or Asda, you know, whatever vertical you find yourself in or, you know, to my point from earlier, much, much, much smaller companies that just have a need for three or four uh, charging stations or three or four vehicles they're looking to electrify. Each customer is important because ultimately they become an ambassador for our efforts and also for this mass adoption of electric vehicles. You know, so that's that that's the take that we have. Every whether it's a residential customer or a fleet manager or a large corporate looking to electrify their fleet, they're all inadvertently becoming ambassadors in their communities to say, I've made the switch, I'm happy with it. It has been the right switch, whether it's for a personal reason or a financial reason. Um, and then to carry on that narrative to their friends and family to do the same. Uh, and, and, and long may that continue is, is my view. Um, Johan, you, we've got time for one more question. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned um, uh, a minute ago about solar PV, uh, and we've also got battery storage. But aside from choosing greener vehicles, what other ways should SMEs be thinking about reducing their environmental impact? Yeah, so you know, it's it's from a from an ESG mandate. Um, we have an academy that we run internally where we look at your your total carbon footprint as an organization. So we run through each and every element of your business, and we start addressing the topics that we feel we can have an impact on to reduce that carbon footprint. It's talking about your heating and ventilation within your building. You know, what kind of solar shading you're using to offset that need to cool the building if you've got external solar shading. Looking at water usage. Um, obviously, our subject matter expertise for the time being focuses on the electric vehicle element, which is a huge carbon offset. Um, but looking towards the future, that, that will become a, a much wider conversation. And, and it's imperative that small businesses, medium and large, all look at their total carbon footprint and seek creative means to offset that. We have the benefit of a technology roadmap society-wide that's rapidly expanding to facilitate exactly that. Again, it comes back to you know, whether you are a chief uh, sustainability officer or a sustainability manager, having the requisite knowledge to be able to address these topics. You know, and that, that's, again, where the, the vendors like ourselves come in to be able to have that conversation with confidence to say, when we look at your business or your home in this case, you know, you need to consider a battery backup because when electricity is affordable, you can put electricity in that, in that battery and then consume it when the, the, there is peak demand in the grid. You, know, you then become a good citizen of the grid. So organizations as legal entities become good citizens of the grid when they have solar panels on their roofs, battery backups you know, minimizing water consumption, not printing out emails, consuming, you know, saving on paper. These are all, you know, it's all about marginal gains each and every day in our behaviors as individuals that then translate into a more sustainable future. And it's really that simple. You know, it's, it's that knowledge base and accountability that we have separate from someone telling us to do that, you know, separate from the government or uh, and, and, and a third party saying you have to do this, it should be an inherent want. And that's what we're seeing from our consumers in the UK. There is a, a real appreciation for being considerate towards the environment because ultimately we want to leave uh, the next generation with a wonderful planet to live on. You know? And we haven't done a great job of that in the past, but we're getting much better as a society at creating that future. That's a, a great way to uh, to end the interview, Johan. I mean, it's clear to me that there's a real opportunity here for SMEs to get on this journey and, and to and to maybe circumvent some of the more difficult challenges that we have talked about. Um, thank you very much, uh, Johan and the Phoenix Works uh, for joining Greenfleet Talks and uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please tune in again soon for uh, another Greenfleet Talks. <laughs>